Okay, so today I'm interviewing Corey Hill. Um, Corey, it's great to have the opportunity to chat with you. Um, I know I haven't seen you in many years, um, but just to the viewers out there, um, I thought I'd just introduce you by introducing your sporting achievements, um, and then we can have a chat. So first of all, um, he's a World Surf Ski Champion from 2000, uh, for 2015 and 2017. Uh, he's a World Champion in Tahiti in 2015, uh, Molokai World Champion in 2015, the Perth Doctor Champion in 2015. He's also qualified for the Nutrigrain Ironman World Series three times, um, fifth in Aussie Nationals in the Ironman, uh, and obviously many more accolades, which I, I won't go on and on because we'll be here for ages just going through all of them. But uh, firstly, Corey, I'd like to just start off by saying um, it's fantastic having you here. And uh, the first question I have for you today is where do you grow up and how did you get into sports? Uh, I grew up in Adelaide, so it's a bit of a, I guess, colder climate, probably probably similar to, to your Cape Town over in South Africa and um, just that little bit colder, but my, my old man, uh, Gavin Hill, was, was always involved with Grange Surf Club and um, I started started doing nippers, I, I guess. I've always looked at it and thought, I wonder if I was always that keen or if I was forced to because because he was so, um, I guess he was so dominant in the, in the competitive scene in, in Adelaide, so um from there, couldn't couldn't get me away from the beach. I loved it every second of it. We got the opportunity to move to the Gold Coast when I was fifteen, and that was an, a lifestyle choice at the time. My old man got a, a job opportunity at North Pier, so I think that's probably when you were competing. There, I remember seeing you doing a lot of rehab, doing the shoulder stuff in the in the gym, and um, I think it, it was always natural at North Pier to become competitive because every training session was like another race. Like you rock up to races now and I guess the days that we were training there were probably like an Australian final at, at times. And um, you didn't realise it at the time when you were coming in eighth to tenth in a, in a ski in a ski um, paddleback or in a, in a race around the Cairns, you're probably still going to be able to make a final at, at Aussies or at, at the um, peak, year, at the pointy end of competition. So I, I guess it was quite natural to... To be a small fish in, in a uh, sorry a big fish in a small pond and then move to Gold Coast and all of a sudden you're a little bit smaller but naturally just progressing until you until you start racing the uh, Hank McGregor, Sean Rice, the Mock Brothers and um, yeah, I think the thing that opened my eyes up the most was um, Shannon next time going to to Hong Kong and actually having a win over there and it was like oh there you go like he's an Ironman it's he was doing what we were doing doing much the same training sessions obviously and um, yeah, from there I took a liking to the to the longer stuff. Um, and again, remember doing all the gold sessions with Luke Nisbet over in, when he was at North Fifth, and um, I guess doing the killing out of gold with him. Oh, probably two thousand and eight, probably going back ten years now. Um, that's when I sort of started to realise that I was probably more, I guess, more of a better fit for that longer stuff than the short stuff. So, uh, who's one of your uh, role models, and what did you learn from them? Uh, again, I, I guess my old man, like he's still probably fitter than me, to be honest. It's it's a bit scary. He he's out there every day. He's he's always pushing himself. He's he's in the gym. He's keeping fit. Like uh, in the ad breaks, he's doing sit ups. It's almost annoying. You're sort of trying to have a conversation with him, and he's puffing and sweating at dinner table because he wants to get that extra <laughs> extra little bit in. So um, he, he's obviously a bit of a role model. And then I guess a lot of the people that I've trained with over the years, um, seeing how hard they push themselves, some are all that talented and they build their way up to get to to get to this point where they are very competitive and then you've got the natural ones that probably don't have to train all that much but they're super skillful. So um your Shannon Nextons, your K Nextons, they're all they're all great competitors and they've all got their natural abilities. They all work for harder things as well. So it, yeah. Probably those guys. Uh, you're a bit of a, a hero here in South Africa with your, your surf ski results. Um, uh, almost everywhere you go, yeah, um, you know, people just love paddling. I mean, you, you can rock up to a race on, uh, or like just a, a standard paddle on Saturday and you'll have like probably 200 guys paddling. Um, so I think one question I'd like to ask is, uh, what is one great session or training session you'd recommend for people who want to improve their downwind paddling? So I'm, I'm a, if you get good wind like we almost did on the weekend, we had, we had big swell here on the weekend. There's nothing better than a paddle back for me. If you just get dropped off 20 k's down the down the road and and just paddle back with that wind. But if you're going to talk about a proper session, we Mackenzie Einard and myself have just started getting into training again for Molokai now to to get 
I guess, 50 kilometre fit, which is which is not such an easy thing to do. So we jump on the river sometimes and we do six 2Ks and it's all just at, at the best pace you can. And um, just before Worlds, for instance, we did a lot of... Um, so we do two five minutes into it, race back with the win, two fours into it, race back with it, two threes back, two twos back, two ones back. And I know that from pre- previous experiences going to Hong Kong, I'd um, been beaten in that last five kilometres a lot. So I'd, I'd, that, that hurt, I guess. And um, at the end of those sessions, myself and Mackenzie were going, okay, well, how do we how do we fix that? Okay, well, if it's going to be a five... 5k slog at the end we'll do another five two minutes at the end here out into it at, at your best pace and just like really focusing on that strength and technique and i think that's probably what got myself across the line and mckenzie um really close to hitting those podium positions this year it was just that little bit extra at the end we do just a little bit extra it's the one two percenters at the end but um um i heard a good quote it was leaving no stone, stone unturned and unfortunately yeah. with a full-time job and that sort of thing we came to the conclusion that maybe it's just all the big stones you had to turn over first and then the little ones came next. So whenever you can fit in your physio, your massage, your stretching, that sort of thing, it wasn't the the core ingredient to the success. It was if you couldn't make Monday afternoon training, you had to go Tuesday afternoon. You couldn't just do your stretching training session on Tuesday or the little things. It was you had to make sure that all those big sessions were done. Uh, what type of training uh, would you recommend in terms of cross training for uh, becoming a great downwind paddler? So I've, I've always found this one interesting because I guess I've always tried gym, I've always tried running, I've done all this stuff. But um, to me, cross training is always just something that keeps you motivated, and it's something else that you see quick improvement with. Because see, for running, I'm not a, I'm not a good runner. But if I start this week, I might be able to run at 4.30 pace and then in a couple of weeks you get get down to four-minute pace. But all of a sudden, I'm super motivated. You're seeing progression really quickly. And same with gym. You start to you feel your core switching on. You're feeling that you're sitting up better. As I say here right now. <laughs> um, you feel that you're sitting up better in your uh, everyday office life. You're driving around and you're feeling a bit stronger. And I feel like just any sort of cross-training for me is just you're feeling a lot better and you're seeing this improvement a lot quicker. It's, it's, I guess when you're at that pointy end of surf ski, you, you see, you see improvement and you definitely see fitness come along, but, um, it's probably the, like we were saying before, the two or three percenters and that's, it's a lot easier to see it in your cross training. So I quite enjoy running in gym. Um, I've noticed as I've got older with training, um, I've had to listen to my body a lot more and sort of, I uh, actually, I'm, I'm guilty of um, even not even having a training program sometimes. Now, how do you plan your training, um, and do you just train how you feel on the day? Um, yes and no, I guess. I, I, I've always been a big believer in just like if you rock up to a race and you're not feeling good, unfortunately, you have to, you still have to race. So I'm always a big believer in every session you get to, it has to be 100%. And again, I guess I'm a bit time poor um, having having that job. So. It is just one of those things that every session I get to, I have a crack. But then at the same time, you really do have to listen to yourself, don't you? It's, it's If you're really not feeling it and you think that you're going to push yourself into sickness or injury, it's time to pull up and do the best that you can do on the day. It's not a race. It's, it's just training. But at the same time, it's not the easiest thing to do. Sometimes you're telling yourself that there's this big thing around the corner that you've got to get to and... and um, that's almost a challenge yourself is telling yourself to warm up a bit. Uh, what is the difference between your standard training week and, and your training week prior to race day? I like to keep it going a little bit, but um, for those international races, so those three or four that I do get to each year, um, I guess it's you do a lot less. So for me, I still get on the water just as much, but it's probably instead of doing a 15, 20 kilometre session, you're getting out there and you're doing six or seven. And that's when I really start to listen to my body. Like it's just making sure that you're loose and limbo. It's, it's not at all pushing yourself. Even if you're feeling like you want to do a two kilometre really hard, uh, sorry, or even a two minute or 200, 200 strokes, anything like that, you're just listening to your body. And if you feel like it's going to make you sore or that your body's saying, or oh, just don't give it a crack, then I really just back it up and and um, let the body rest. And I think that, um, for me, a massage works quite well that week also. Um, who do you train with and uh, how has it helped you with your training? Um, I train with Northcliffe quite a bit 
And sort of longer stuff at the moment, after Boothy went to SUPS, it's been myself and Mackenzie Heinard. So we're always welcoming other people to come across, but I think we also train at the, we train in Surfers Paradise. The so parking's not the best. And then at the same time, we train at 4 p.m. each afternoon. So um, it makes it hard for a lot of other people. We'd love people to come and train with us and push us and or, or learn from us or they can teach us a thing or two as well. But um, at the moment, it has been just Mackenzie and myself. I definitely find, uh, you know, it's amazing how, you know, you go to a different country and there's a focus on entirely different sports. And I find it's amazing how you've done so well in surf ski paddling where, you know, Australia particularly seems to be focused more on the surf Ironman. So, you know, it, it's, you know, just looking at those changes and, and how you've been able to adapt to surf ski is absolutely amazing. Um, one other question, uh, what do you eat on a standard training day? Because a lot of our guys here, um, and even ordinary, even some of my friends who are battling with, uh, you know, trying to, you know, having this diet and that diet, um, you know, what, what do you eat? And um, maybe even what, what advice could you give to someone who perhaps wants to have more energy? I don't know if I'm the best role model for, <laughs> for this one because I, I, I honestly just do keep eating exactly exactly as I would. So if it's, if it's muesli that morning or... Sometimes if it's a weekend and you like a lot of the time on the weekends, we also try and get the wind in the afternoon. So that means a two or three o'clock, uh, two or three o'clock paddle, which means at lunch I'll have exactly the same as what I would have for lunch, which is it could be sushi, it could be a homemade burrito, it could be anything like that. And um, you're pretty flexible. Very, but I think that my body's also adjusted to that. I'm, I remember when I first, first started doing surf ski races and it was a bit of a routine of myself to have a Coke and a Mars bar before I started just to just get to get a lot of sugar in your body. And um, I soon I'll, learned that that I'll, probably wasn't the, yeah, the best. I'll cut that out of the interview. <laughs> wasn't the best. <laughs> <laughs> but um, from there, you live and learn and, and little things. like It also depends on where you're travelling. Like you go to Hong Kong and you, you race at this... 10 o'clock in the morning, it's not the easiest time to get food down that morning, you're, you're across the road, you get a coffee in you, but you don't really feel like, you don't really feel like eating because you're often a little bit nervous, and they've got these little muesli things, so you have a muesli maybe, but the other, the other option is a quiche or something like that, like it's, <laughs> there's not much to, that you would usually eat, so true, true. I think I've, I've learnt to just okay. keep on training exactly as, like eating exactly whatever you would because when it gets to race day you can't necessarily be guaranteed what you want to have now i've seen you on facebook a couple of times uh you know uh post a, a little bit on that um device you've got and it seems to measure your stroke rate and also uh the distance in terms of your reach on perhaps your left and your right arm uh, now when i see that um you know it's uh, i've never used one of those devices um can you explain how that benefits your paddling yeah, I, I guess analysis is huge. I, I'm like I'm always wearing this garment as well. It's just on me, and I feel, <clears throat> I'm an accountant by trade, so I'm looking at numbers nonstop. It's I'll, I'll be doing a paddle back with Mackenzie, and um, he'll say, "Oh, what are you what are you sitting at?" And if it's like point nine nine, I'll go out and do the extra ten meters to make sure that it's clicked over to the next kilometer and things like this. Like I'm a bit of a head case when it comes to numbers. Like I could tell you on the day. What, what times I think you should be doing for this downwind paddle and that sort of thing. So um, the analysis side for me is is pretty huge. As for the stroke length, I, I found that really interesting just purely because it would change, obviously, into the wind, downwind, sidewind, over your left shoulder, over your right shoulder and this sort of thing. And it was hard to determine how to change, I guess, more so than it was just interesting because every condition, every day it, it changes on easterly, westerly, southerly, northerly, like, Northeast, it's a slight bit off. There's a bit more swell and that sort of thing. Like it, it became, I don't think you'd get to a, a race and say I'm going to change my technique based on based on the conditions. It was just more interesting to sort of see how it did vary. Um, now, what do you do in terms of your warm up? Uh, or uh, right before your major race, like on race day, um, an hour or two before. Hydrate. I get a lot of water in me. I try and drink as much as I can, just because. I've got this little fear of dehydrating throughout the throughout the race, and I've, I've had it before. Where one of my first international races was in Dubai, and I didn't have <clears throat> I didn't have any water, and I remember sitting on Matt Bowman's wash for as far as I could, and just thinking like, "Geez, it feels like the the water in the in the ocean was going to dry up." That's how hot <laughs> it was, and um, <laughs> start eating sand or something like that, and 
So ever since those days, I've sort of learned maybe I should drink as much as I can prior. And um, I think Oscar and Dean are much the same. When you ask them how far, how much um, water they take on their paddles, it's it's often just a, a litre. And that will get Oscar through a, through a Molokai. And Dean is often much the same. He's a bit of a camel where you just don't have anything. So I hydrate a lot. And I'll just go for much the same as we were talking about before with the taper week. Just go out for a paddle, listen to yourself. I try and get a bit of a sprint out just to get the cobwebs out. Probably more so just get the nerves out and just make sure that you're, you're feeling good. Um, but I find it the hardest time of time of the year is getting ready for a race because you're sitting there and all of a sudden you've, you've come to what you've been looking forward to for so long that all of a sudden you're just not looking forward to it because you're so, <laughs> because you're so nervous or because you're just... You just want to get it over and done with. But once the gun goes, you're, you're on the same person and For sure. you're, you're just dealing with what you've got. Now, what are your plans uh, in terms of surf ski paddling for 2018? So this year, I'm hoping to get to New Zealand. I'm going to do Canada um, and America. Unfortunately, I don't think I'll get to Mauritius this year. Um, so that, that's maybe the race I'll do then. <laughs> no? That's the race <laughs> I'll do then. <laughs> I know, oh, it's such a lovely place and it's, it kills me to say that I won't make it, I'll, I'll push for it, but um, we'll see how we go. Okay. And then at the end of the year, you've got the doctor in Hong Kong again and that's okay. um, that's always such a great month, November, it's 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 all you think about really, it's just the downwind and you're looking at Wind Guru or you're looking at what the winds are doing in each destination that week. Uh, that now, month. do you feel um, ocean paddling is heading in the right direction? Yeah, I really do. I think that we've got a lot of passionate people behind the sport and that's that's a great thing. Like you see a lot of sports that fall by the wayside because there's people that are probably in it more for themselves. Um, in Australia, we've got such a great series. Like there was a, this weekend we've got Bridge to Beach and I think it was a, the 12th race of the series. So it's we've got races from, when was it, probably... August, September until now, and it's it was packed. Like before before Hong Kong and the Doctor, we were doing races most weekends. It was great. Um, for the World Surf Ski Series, it's it, there's there's races all around the world, and it, it's so fortunate for I guess both of us where we're on the Southern Hemisphere, so we get to go and chase summer a little bit and go get a little bit more heat, get out of our own countries when it's a little bit cold, and um, that works really well. I think that it's always going to be great to see. Um, more races pop up like we have and I, I think that shows growth and it also shows that other countries are definitely interested in what we do and they probably not only want to travel for races but they want to show show us their great paddling destinations um but there's obviously a lot of room to go as well we've, we've got we've got a lot of way long way to go to get to um to make it a bigger sport again so no, i'd you... love to know what i can do as well to help because <laughs> Yeah, I feel like that's my obligation as well. Um, you definitely are doing it. I mean, uh, in terms of your racing ability and also your, you know, sharing of information. Um, you know, I always learn things when you post on Facebook, so that's great. Um, now, do you think uh, surf ski paddling will become an Olympic event? I don't know. I probably don't think so. Probably not in my career. Um, to be honest, I've, I've only had little bits to do with, the, like, federations and that sort of thing and um it seems very political it doesn't seem like it's the easiest thing to just remove a sport and put one in or even just put one in in general so it'll be interesting to see where it all goes and i've heard lots of stories about it i haven't actually got involved in any of it it's just you hear about specifics of like the ski that has to be there and then you hear that it might be the same as the sailing course but you hear all this and you don't know who's who's actually created the story, if it's come from someone with authority or whether I've just hear, heard it five, fifth person down. So I, I'd love to know. <laughs> it would be awesome if we get, did get that opportunity, but um, I'm also pretty happy travelling the world unregulated, to be honest. It's 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 a pretty cool sport where we're in. Like, you can rock up and you race. You could race 200 of your best mates and it's not, ex it's, it's not excluded, if, uh, if that's the best way to put it. Like, I rocked up to... This weekend, for instance, um, <clears throat> Bridge to Beach, there's going to be 400 starters. So yeah. it's a pretty it's a pretty cool feeling to just have all these people rock up and not have to qualify and just do what they love on a Sunday morning. It definitely seems like, uh, you know, surf sea paddling has, has grown since I left because um, I, I don't remember that many races on back then. Um, now, no. 
Um, in terms of uh, coaching, um, who's been your best coach and why? Well, oh, have to go, have to go, my old man. Then I'm a bit biased, but um, no, I think he's always pushed me in the right, in the right directions. Um, at the moment, we've got Kevy, Kevy Morrison. He's obviously a good coach, and he's he's also got great ideas. Pat O'Keefe back in the day, he was probably more of a, a yeah. trainer, as you'd know. It was it was hardcore. Like you'd you'd be paddling in at six thirty p.m. pitch black, six foot swell, and. <laughs> Like those, those days probably made me a little bit tougher. And then um, I guess at the moment, a lot of the sessions that me and Mac are doing, we're making up ourselves and we're, we're sort of going from what we know and probably putting little little percentages on top. So we know, we know that what worked this year worked and next year we might even just do that 10% more again and try and just progress and see how far we can push that until you go, okay, that's, that's the limit and from there maybe back it up a bit or we should be a bit smarter or more effective or efficient, these sorts of things. So, now, yeah, if, it's going to be interesting. If you were a coach, um, what approach would you use for athletes? Um, and the reason why I asked that question is um, I, I'm currently actually coaching uh, one of the surf clubs here in, in Durban. And, uh, you know, it's definitely, you know, different. it seems like different athletes, you need to approach them in a different way. Yeah, definitely. And I don't envy that position at all. Um, I feel like, I feel like, Back in the day, Pat probably hated me because I used to be somebody that probably wanted to think a little bit more than just doing a paddle back. And um, the older I get, it's quite funny because now I feel like I really all I want to do is work hard and and push myself as hard as I can for as long as I can. So um, I think even if, if you're the coach of myself and you saw myself progress over the last 10 years, you'd probably be frustrated because you would have had to change your own coaching methods on me. So I think it's it's a difficult thing to coach a squad. You've got so many different personalities going through so many different things, wanting different outcomes. So surf life saving is a really hard one at the moment too because there's there's so many people that want to make the sport professional, but unfortunately at the moment there's there's only a limited area for you to be professional. There's there's prize money on top three and that sort of thing. So um, that would be very hard because the person getting the fourth to tenth might have to go get a job, and then the top three get further ahead and these sorts of things so um i think it's just individual individuals need different attention and different um probably strategies so i don't envy that position <laughs> <laughs> um what are three great exercises in the gym you do um that help paddling um anything that does core so I, i'm a big fan of chin-ups um to be honest i'd probably say stretching as well and then also just anything core work. So anything that can, like even, so the other day I was in the gym, I've just started up with uh, Ali Day's gym and um, was just doing the baby crawl across <laughs> across the floor and I couldn't couldn't believe how hard it was to, to keep your core switched on and keep the pole on your back and this sort of thing. And it was, it was quite amazing. It's just like bringing things right back to basics of how you, it's, it's movement orientated. So it was, just if you can get this right, okay, then you can progress to a bit further and obviously then that will relate back to surf ski. At the moment that seems to be going well, but you look at what you're doing wrong and you go, okay, well, there's another 10% you could probably make up. True. Now, um, in terms of, I know you've obviously been in sport for a long time and been always surrounded yourself with, uh, you know, people who are at the high end of sport. Um, obviously, there's a whole bunch of people out there who just want to keep fit and healthy. Um, but they they need to try and overcome uh, certain mental blocks they may have. What what advice would you give to someone who perhaps um, doubts themselves or, uh, or or doesn't quite believe in their abilities? What what advice could you give to them or even tips? I think just get out there and do it. It's um, <clears throat> I know I've been a bit of a bad one for it in the past where you go oh, I'll start next Monday or I'll start next Monday and these sorts of things and all of a sudden you get a month down the track and you're meant to start in January or you're meant to start in February and all of a sudden it's April and you go oh out yeah, like how many Mondays have I done that for sure. now and um, same with same with eating well same with anything like that I think I think it's routine routine based and once you once you get into a good routine it's hard to break that or you feel bad or guilty for not doing something so um, that would be my biggest advice would be just get out there and, and try it if it's if you're if you're nervous about the conditions get out there with mates and if it's a bit of a downwind and it's it's 10 knots and you've never been out out in the ocean get out there with mates and just give it a crack because 
confidence is a huge thing. And once you once you start to progress again, you get used to it. Then you're used to the twenty knots or thirty knots, and then all of a sudden you just yeah, it makes the sport a lot more fun as well. Uh, what is one thing that you think people don't know about you that you want to share? Oof. Um. I mean, I've always, I've always known you as the, you know, the cruisy oak, uh, no issues, no complaints, go with the flow. Um, so that's why I asked that question, because maybe there's something I can even learn about you. There you go. Well, um, in my spare time, I'm a, I guess people probably do know I'm a full-time accountant, but I work out at the bakery and I try not to taste as much bread as I should. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and how can people follow you on social media um, and get in touch if they got any questions or, you know, I uh, want, to, want to perhaps some tips on paddling or just uh, fitness in general. I think the easiest way is probably just jump on Facebook, jump onto my page and shoot through a question. I'm usually pretty good at replying. It might take me a day or two, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to help out. If you've got, I've got, I always get questions about paddles and that sort of thing. And um, sometimes people might think that I'm a bit biased, but at the same time, I think that I <laughs> give the, the best answer and it's the stuff that's working for me. So um, yeah, I hope that, people do contact me as well because it, I love I love the sport. I want to see it progress and I want to see other people enjoy it as much as I do. Uh, you're 100% right. And I think when, you know, social media first came out, I was a bit like, you know, you know, I didn't really know how to react to it because it's almost like uh, it's, yeah. you think it's something, you know, in terms of vanity. But uh, now that, um, you know, you can use it and in terms of sharing information and building a community around sport and helping people, um, yeah. it, it can definitely... Um, if used in the right way, you know, be a great thing. So um, I'd just like to close and, and just say, um, you know, thanks for taking the time to chat with me today. Um, I know 2018 is going to be a, a great year for you. Um, and hopefully I'll see you overseas and, and, and perhaps, you know, maybe slipstream you for the first 200 meters in some race and, and, uh, and uh, have maybe a beer after. Get precious. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, thank you, Corey. No, thank you very much. I've, I've enjoyed it.